Hey everybody, sorry I'm late. I know I'm terribly late today. Um, I do want to just say something right at the outset and then we'll get to your questions. We are very concerned by the movement of a Russian convoy across Ukraine's border. We strongly condemn this action and any actions that Russian forces take that increase tensions in the region. Russia should not send vehicles, persons, or cargo of any kind into Ukraine, whether under the guise of humanitarian convoys or any other pretext, without Kyiv's express permission. This is a violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity by Russia. Russia must remove its vehicles and its personnel from the territory of Ukraine immediately. Failure to do so will result in additional costs and isolation. We're currently consulting with the International Red Cross and other international partners, and as we have more details to provide on what we know, we'll certainly do that. Lita. Um, does the U.S. consider this an invasion, and is the U.S. taking any action? Um, either calling any counterparts overseas, either in Ukraine or in Russia? It's certainly an unauthorized entry into Ukraine by, these, by this convoy. Um, and we are consulting, as I said, with international partners right now about next steps. I, I don't have anything additional to add at this time. Um, and I think, again, in my opening statement, made it very, very clear that uh, what we expect uh, of Russia. But no phone calls or anything yet with either between the administration and This and is just right. happening today, so I'm not aware of any um, outreach uh, today by, uh, certainly by this building, and I won't speak for other uh, agencies in the federal government. I would remind you, though, I mean, that, uh, the secretary did talk to Minister Shoigu uh, just a few days ago, and uh, the minister guaranteed, was his words, uh, that there would be no military intervention uh, uh, using the pretext of humanitarian relief, and in fact assured us that there would be no military members as a part of this humanitarian convoy. General, you said under the guise of a humanitarian convoy, does you have, the U.S. have evidence that there are military forces and military equipment? I'm not, prepared, I'm not prepared to speak to specific evidence at this time. Um, we've made our position very, very clear uh, that they should not be doing this under the guise of, of, of a humanitarian convoy to use that as an excuse um, uh, to act to uh, to cross the border in an unauthorized way, we have a lot more work to do here, and I think we'll we'll sort this out uh, throughout the day. I think you'll hear more from us uh, throughout the day. Joe, Admiral Kirby on Iraq. Uh, we heard yesterday Secretary Hegel and Chairman Dempsey talking about a long-term strategy. Could you give us a sense what what does it mean? Are we going to face to see changes in regards to the current operation right now in Iraq? I think what the secretary was referring to, and I'm pretty sure the chairman uh, was referring to, was uh, that we need to have a regional approach here and, and, and an agency and an international approach uh, about this threat posed by this particular extremist group, ISIL, and that, and that this, was, this, this would take time to develop this kind of multilateral and multinational national approach um, to dealing with this threat. The president himself said that this wasn't going to be all over in a matter of weeks. Um, I think we're all, we all recognize that this group didn't grow up overnight. They didn't get the capabilities that they got overnight. We've been watching this for a while, um, and then we all recognize it's going to take a while. But just as critically, Joe, it's going to take a while for everybody, not just the United States military. And the secretary was clear about this yesterday. You're not going to see the answer. Uh, to all ISIL problems through a, a military lens. It's, it, we're, we're a component, we're a tool. Uh, we, uh, we, we, are, uh, we are conducting operations inside Iraq against this group in support of Iraqis and Kurdish forces, but we're not going to be the only tool in the toolbox that, that can or should be used. Quick, quick follow up, Admiral. Do you, do you know, does the Pentagon know what's the size of ISIL? in Iraq and in Syria? Are we talking about 10,000, 20,000? Do you have any, any numbers? It's a difficult number to get at, uh, Joe, and we, believe me, we've asked ourselves th that question. It, it fluctuates a lot. It changes, um, uh, if not weekly, then certainly daily. I mean, it's a, it's a constant fluctuation, so it's hard to pin it down. This isn't a classic army you know, with an order of battle that you can just take a look at a map and say, this is how many they have. Uh, clearly, it's thousands. Um, there's no question about that. But it changes every day. And as you, as we've talked about, they, you know, they, 
have free flow across that border between Syria and Iraq, which for all intents and purposes doesn't exist for them. Um, so it's very difficult to pin it down to a given number. Yes. Um, can we go back on Russia for a minute and another question? Is it not accurate that you now estimate there might be up to 18,000 troops near that border between Russia and Ukraine? <clears throat> and isn't the reality that you have seen very recently a number of additional heavy weapons, including SA-22 surface-to-air missiles and long-range artillery, go across? And my second question is, can you bring us up to date on this uh, threatening encounter the Chinese military has had with the U.S. Navy this week in the air. Okay, there's a lot there, Barbara. Let's we'll start with uh, Ukraine. I'm um, I'm reticent, as I typically am, to give a hard number on uh, uh, Russian troops arrayed along the border. I have said um, for several weeks now that it, it's north of 10,000. I believe it is still north of 10,000. Uh, we do believe that they continue to add to uh, their battalion tactical groups there uh, along the border. Um, and Is it we're, closer to 18, well north of 10? I'm going to stay where I've stayed, which is it's north of 10. Um, it does fluctuate. Now, we have seen a consistent increase in the last week or so. Um, haven't exactly seen uh, troops moving away. Uh, they have certainly added and reinforced those, those troops. Um, but again, I'm really reticent to get into numbers. It's hard for for us here in the Pentagon to give an exact order of battle for another military's forces when, you know, you're not there with them. So well north, uh, north of 10,000, uh, I think that's, that's fair to say. More worrisome than the number uh, is the readiness and the capability that exists in these battalion tactical groups. They are, as I've described before, combined arms capable, armor, artillery, infantry, air defense. Um, they're very ready, they're very capable, they're very mobile, and they continue to do nothing but just increase the tension on the other side uh, with Ukraine. Just as, and this gets to your second of three questions, the, the, just as worrisome is the continued support to the separatists, which continues uh, to this day um, and does include heavy weapon systems, air defense systems, artillery systems. Um, uh, tanks. So we're seeing we're seeing a lot of hardware going across that border on a routine basis. And Russian troops. Well, yeah, it's hard to believe. I think it, it strains credulity to think that this equipment's not moving across the border, uh, accompanied by Russian forces. I, I wouldn't get into an estimate right now. But again, let's not get fixated on the numbers. Then we tend to. Dr drill down on that. I mean, I think what's what's more worrisome is the capabilities, the capabilities that exist in those troops on that side of the border, and the capabilities that continue to find their way into separatist hands or in support of separatist actions. That's the real problem, and that's what needs to stop. China. Now, you asked about China, um, and I know you may all have seen a press report on this, so let me give you a, a little bit of a... Uh, I'm, I'm going to just give you an update here about uh, about it in case you weren't um, following. But uh, on the 19th of August, an armed Chinese fighter jet conducted a dangerous intercept of a U.S. Navy P-8 Poseidon aircraft, a patrol aircraft that was on a routine mission. The intercept took place about 135 miles east of Hainan Island in international airspace. We have registered our strong concerns to the Chinese about the unsafe and unprofessional intercept, which posed a risk to the safety and the well-being of the air crew uh, and was inconsistent with customary international law. Also, it undermines, and we've made this clear, that it undermines efforts to continue developing military-to-military -military relations with the, with the Chinese military. Um, so at, uh, that's where we are now. Um, How close did they get? It's uh, difficult to say with um, precision, but um, uh, within 30 feet of the P-8, uh, very, very close, uh, very dangerous. Is it correct that as, as they went within 30 feet, they moved around the U.S. aircraft over, under, around it at uh, close range? We believe that they, uh, they made several passes, three different occasions, crossed under the aircraft, uh, with uh, one pass having only 50 to 100 feet separation. Uh, the Chinese jet also passed the nose of the P-8 at 
uh, 90 degrees uh, with its belly toward the P8 Poseidon. Um, we believe to make a point of showing its weapons loadout. Um, and uh, then they flew directly under uh, and alongside the P-8, uh, bringing their wingtips, as I said, to within 20 feet. Um, uh, and then conducted a roll, a roll over the P-8, passing within 45 feet. So, um, that, I mean a roll. Um, I'm not an aviator, so I'm not good talking with my hands, but basically if yours your P-8, your jet fire going over like this. Um, so pretty aggressive and uh, um, very unprofessional. As I said, we've registered our concerns very strongly uh, through official uh, uh, diplomatic channels with the, with the Chinese. Uh, this kind of behavior um, not only is unprofessional, it's unsafe, and it is certainly not in keeping with the kind of military-to-military uh, -military relationship uh, relations that we'd like to have with, uh, with China. Did I answer your question? Do you have photos or video? I believe there's imagery of it, uh, Jim. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure. I'd like to follow up on Joe's question. Um, can you tell us is the administration more seriously considering now expanding the air campaign in Iraq to directly confront ISIL in a way that it hasn't with the with the goal with an expanded mission perhaps of defeating them or expanding the strikes to Syria? Because some of the comments that administration officials have made in the past few days suggest that maybe that's under more serious consideration than it has been in the past. And secondly, can you update us on the provision of weapons um, by the United States or by allied countries to the Peshmerga? Uh, on your first question, I, I think Secretary Hagel and the chairman spoke pretty well to it yesterday. I don't know that I can um, expound on it any further. Um, uh, we continue to uh, assess and monitor uh, ISIL activities. That's one of the reasons why we put assessment teams there in the first place, uh, to get a, a good situ uh, situational awareness of what's going on there. Um, as you know, we are uh, um, engaged in supporting Iraqi security forces, uh, um, and not just only, but, in, you know, with kinetic airstrikes, um, which we believe has, have had an effect. I'm not going to um, I'm not going to get ahead of planning that hasn't been done or um, decisions that haven't been made. We don't telegraph our punches. Uh, but um, I think you can rest assured that the leadership here in the Pentagon understands the threat posed by this group, understands um, the threat posed inside Iraq, and uh, we are gaining every day a better understanding of um, Iraqi security force and Kurdish force capability in, in meeting the threat inside Iraq. The, two points I think are important to make, uh, and I'm not, I'm going to make these points, but I also know I'm not answering your question. I'm not going to talk about any future planning or future operations. But it is important to remind everybody that uh, th these, what we are doing in there is in support of Iraq, and that ultimately this is a fight that the Iraqi security forces have got to take on. Um, the second point is there's not going to be a, a purely military solution. And so when the secretary and the chairman were up here talking to you yesterday, they talked about using all the elements of, of, of American power and international influence as well to deal with this. Ultimately, the answer is going to be found in good governance. Now, I know that's not, you know, that doesn't offer everybody the, you know, the immediacy that they might want to have with dealing with, with this threat, this very serious threat. But ultimately, it's it's defeating the ideology through good governance. It's, it's removing the unstable conditions, the petri dish through which groups like this can, can foster and grow. And that's, that's really where we've got to get long term. And so we are a tool in the toolbox. Uh, we're going to continue to conduct the missions that we've been conducting in Iraq. You've seen it more today. I think Central Command released yet another press release now. We're up over 93 airstrikes. Um, but ultimately, that's not going to be what solves this problem. When does it become a question of U.S. self-defense versus this um, organization that's posing a transnational threat? Because, you know, the administration has said again and again that it won't hesitate to act against any organization or terrorist group. That directly threat threatens American interests. That, to me, seems different than the Iraqi, you know, helping them to fight, defeat, you know, push back but, ISIL. But, and, I, but I think what you're seeing us do in Iraq d does both of those things. And, uh, again, the secretary mentioned this yesterday, that we are, we're, uh, that part of the mission is in, is supporting, advising, assisting, helping Iraqi security forces and Kurdish f forces um, blunt the momentum. We believe we've 
succeeded in blunting that momentum. Um, but it's also about protecting U.S. personnel and facilities, including some of the airstrikes that we're conducting inside Iraq. Uh, uh, I think the United States military has, over the last several years, a pretty good track record of defending American interests and American citizens uh, and American facilities uh, in many places around the world uh, from a, the, you know, protecting them and defending them from terrorist threats. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, uh, there's been uh, we, as you um, as you heard yesterday, and I think I've said it before. Secretary Hagel has stood up a task force here at DoD to examine options uh, and opportunities for us to um, to resupply uh, Kurdish forces. No decisions have come out. I have nothing to announce about that today. Uh, that said, we do um, continue to help uh, the Iraqi government in Baghdad uh, conduct those kinds of uh, resupply missions. Um, uh, in some cases actually flying their equipment uh, up to the north where it needs to get. And we have been um, encouraged by the assistance of uh, international partners uh, like the UK. And uh, I also want to take the opportunity today to thank Albania. Uh, Albania has now come forward and, uh, and uh, offered to conduct resupply missions uh, for uh, Kurdish forces, which again we're very grateful for. Uh, yeah. Can you help uh, uh, just help me understand what Dempsey was saying yesterday? He did not rule out airstrikes inside Syria, did he? The secretary didn't rule anything in or out. I think he said that uh, that options uh, that all options oh, remain available, yeah. and and they, and they do. And I'm not going to speculate about um, where that might take us, Justin. I think you can understand why we wouldn't do that. Um, on the Foley uh, operation, there was a suggestion from at least one member of Congress today that the president or that the White House was slow to approve the rescue mission and that this may have led to not getting there on time, essentially, and, and that the hostages were then moved. Um, do you have any indication that this uh, operation was slowed down in any way? I don't have any such indication, uh, Justin. Um, as we've talked about before, uh, attempts like this uh, which was risky uh, under the best of circumstances. Uh, they take time. They take time to plan. They, they, take, they take time to organize. And just as critically, um, they, it takes time for you to become informed enough to be able to conduct that kind of an operation. Uh, intelligence is not perfect, and it is often layered over time, um, uh, not unlike the way uh, you all do your jobs when you are working with sources. You build a picture over time from many different uh, vehicles, and that's the way intelligence works, and, and that's the way it worked in this, in, in this uh, rescue attempt. I think Chairman Dempsey said it very well yesterday, that, uh, that there was a lot of planning and effort that went into it. And we, once on site, um, had an indication that they had actually been at that site. When they you know, w when they were moved, we don't know. Um, but, uh, but to say that, you know, that it was uh, slow-footed or done in a ham-fisted manner or um, that it was an intel failure, I think, uh, does a disservice to the immense amount of work and, and, and the courageous decision that it was to move forward to actually to make the attempt. It also, if you allow me just a second to editorialize it, I think it says a lot about who we are. Um, not just as a military, but as a country that we're willing to um, that we're willing to try to pull something like that that off. And a lot of bravery, a lot of skill, a lot of courage. There's going to be you know a lot of a lot of names and faces you'll never know um, of of people that put their uh, lives very much at risk to try to save the lives of others. And I think that's pretty darn commendable. And then finally, last question: uh, Is there any update on uh, sending this 300? Uh, U.S. security personnel to Baghdad. Is there any specific threat to the embassy in Baghdad? Yeah. Um, are there plans? Are these people being sent there to prepare for an evacuation? What's going on? I mean, we heard this request from State Department. When is it going to be fulfilled, if at all? The, what I'll tell you now is there um, we are uh, processing uh, a request by the State Department for some additional security force personnel um, for Baghdad specifically. Uh, uh, like all requests that we get for forces, we take them seriously, we explore sourcing options um, and force protection requirements that go along with it and any number of, uh, of other factors that go into this. And we're, we're reviewing that right now. I don't have a decision to announce on it uh, today. Um, and as for the, 
the need, I, I wouldn't get into, uh, I don't talk about specific intelligence matters. I won't do that today. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific threat stream that led to this request, uh, but clearly um, it's the kind of request that we take very seriously and, and we will. Uh, yeah. The, last night, uh, Missouri Representatives Clay and Cleaver met with the Secretary to talk about the 1033 program. Can you tell me if the Secretary is contemplating an official review or even a temporary suspension of that program, and if so, when that might happen? The Secretary is keeping an open mind about the program. Um, he shares the President's uh, concerns about um, any blurring of lines between the military and local law enforcement, of course, certainly um, as, as that concern could lead to the use of military equipment. Uh, but he's not made any decision about conducting a review. He's still very much uh, gathering information about it. He not only met with those two representatives, he, he held a meeting with senior staffers the day before uh, to, uh, to ask lots of probing deep questions about, about this program and how, it's, and how it's operated, but he hasn't made any decisions yet. I, I do want to uh, point out, uh, you know, that m most of the, first of all, the military is not the only source of tactical gear used by law enforcement in this country. Uh, and I think we're losing sight of that. I mean, we look and we see the pictures and we think, well, that's all military. M most of the stuff you're seeing uh, in video coming out of Ferguson is not military equipment. And as I've said before, Ferguson itself only had, they got two Humvees, soft-skinned Humvees from this program and a generator and I think a trailer. Um, and that's it. So a lot of this stuff is not U.S. military equipment. That's point number one. Point number two I would make is 95 percent of the property that is transferred to local law enforcement through this program is not tactical. It's not, it's not weapons. It's shelving, office equipment, communications gear, um, that kind of thing, furniture. So um, it, I, I think it's important to keep this thing um, in perspective. And where the secretary wants to be is he wants to keep it, he wants to, you know, as he looks at this program, wants to make sure that we're striking the right balance, that the right stuff is, is, is being transferred, that the proper accountability um, is in place. But he's also mindful that it's not a good place for the republic, uh, for the Pentagon to be holding strings or carrot and sticks out to local law enforcement. There's a reason why we aren't involved in local law enforcement activities. Uh, and he, he wants to make sure that, that we maintain our proper place inside this democracy. So the local media accounts of these vehicles being heavily armored is incorrect? I don't know whether they're heavily armored or not. They're, I'm them. talking about, no, what I said was the two Humvee vehicles that we provided to Ferguson were soft-skinned, not armored. Now, other tactical vehicles they have, I, I can't speak for where they got them and whether they're armored or not. I just don't know. But I, I just was trying to make the point that as you look at this, the video coming out of Ferguson, I understand how people would look at that and say, well, gee, look at all that military gear. Mo most of it, in fact, almost all of it, is not military gear. It's, it didn't, doesn't belong to us. We didn't provide it to them. Uh, so I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of perspective on your question, which was a good one, I think. Thank you for it, Margaret. Um, we've heard a lot about the response to ISIS needing to be sort of locals retaking their country, right, and, and helping to craft a regional response. Yesterday, mm -hmm. Secretary Hagel talked about uh, the $500 million he wants to put to work to help train and equip Syrians, moderates, that we've That's identified right. that we want to work with. What's the status of that program? And if it's not going to be funded until 2015, is there thought to actually speed that up? The, uh, pro you're right, uh, Margaret. The program is part of our Overseas Contingency Operations budget request that was submitted to Congress um, this summer. Um, that so it's on the hill now for contemplation uh, uh, and um, it has to be authorized by by congress you're also right that it's a fiscal year 15 request so that if if authorized and appropriated we wouldn't be able to access that money and therefore wouldn't be able to execute that program until fiscal year 15. i know of no plans to try to accelerate it again we're working through congress and through the budget the budget vehicles available to us uh, to get at that program while we are waiting for Congress to act, the, the Secretary is working with the Joint Staff, Central Command, um, and of course his own staff here in the Pentagon to further develop the ways in which we would, should we get 
the funding we're asking for, the ways in which we would execute that. I don't have any hard decisions here to announce today. I can't tell you, you know, where it would take place or how many people would be trained. And there's still a vetting process that needs to be fully developed here. So there's a lot of, there's still a lot of homework to do. We have kept Congress informed um, and, until they went out on the break. I mean, we were uh, over there frequently keeping them informed of what the thinking was, but it's not fully developed yet. And we're going to work, uh, the Secretary wants to work closely with Congress as, as they both uh, review the, appro the, the, the request itself uh, and we continue to develop our plans. But isn't there a sense that this needs to be get, this needs to happen quickly? I mean, is, is that what the Secretary is trying to do? We, we are working through the, the, the budgeting process here to develop this program. And, and while, yes, everybody shares a common sense of purpose here when it comes to the uh, train and equip mission for the moderate opposition, uh, we also don't want to get it wrong either. So you, you can only go as fast as right. And that means that you've got to have a good plan in place and that you, and a key to that is a proper vetting process, which we just haven't nailed all that down. It's really important if uh, in order to do this, to have a, a positive impact on the moderate opposition that you're, that you're working with uh, the right sorts of folks. Am I understanding what you're saying uh, to mean that this building would not have the authorities to act without congressional approval we, and not before 2015 we, to do this? We do not have the authorities now to begin a train and equip program with a moderate Syrian opposition. We want to have those authorities and we want to have the resources that go with it. Um, and we also want to build a program that makes sense and that will do the, that will do the job. And we're still working on that right now. Yeah, in the back. In January, the president uh, equated ISIL's capabilities to uh, that of a junior varsity uh, team, so um, which seems to be in direct con contrast with what uh, the secretary said yesterday. I was wondering if there had been new analysis or um, done to to get the secretary to that position, um, and uh, does that mean that ISIS is getting stronger? Uh, I would make a couple of points. One, I'd point you to what the president said uh, yesterday or the day before about ISIL and the threat that they posed, as well as comments made by Secretary Kerry. And, of course, you've heard what Secretary Hagel said. I think everybody has the same view here about the threat posed by ISIL, not just to Iraq, but to the region. Uh, there's no divergence. Um, uh, Jan th this is August. You're talking about comments that were made in January. ISIL, and we've been watching this for months, they have grown in capability. I've said it from the, the podium, as have others. Uh, they have grown in capability um, with speed, uh, um, helped along by resourcing um, from some of their own criminal activity, uh, as well as donations and uh, ransoms, um, and helped along by sanctuary that they have in, in Syria. Uh, so. We've all been watching this. They have advanced in, in capability. And we, we saw the speed with which they gained ground and held ground in northern Iraq um, earlier this summer. So it's a, the, the real answer to your question is it's a constantly changing, fluid situation. And their threat continues to grow. And that's what led us to where we are today, which is that we believe it does pose an imminent threat. And it's a threat that we need to take seriously. The New York Times just moved a story quoting NATO officials um, saying that Russian artillery had f um, fired on uh, Ukrainian forces. What do you know about that, and how does that is that a game changer in any sort of way? I didn't see the New York Times report, so I won't comment on a press report I haven't seen and can't and can't confirm. I'll just go back to what I said at the outset that the the the, the, the support for separatists, the build up along the border, um, the constant flow of of significant weapon systems across the border in Ukraine needs to stop. It just needs to stop. And that's as far as I can go, given what I know. I have not seen that press report. Tony? The one Ukraine question, one budget question. The kind of way going in today, uh, one of your guys a couple of weeks ago said that we, it could be a Trojan horse, actually military equipment going in under the guise of humanitarian. Do you have any indication at all that this is a Trojan horse or is really it's humanitarian supplies, but you still think it's an, a quasi-invasion. We don't have a perfect picture of uh, what's inside those trucks, Tony. What about an imperfect picture? I don't, have, I don't have an imperfect picture 
either of what's inside those trucks. Uh, 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 it's the entry, the unauthorized entry into Ukraine, which, as I said at the outset, is um, uh, is a violation of uh, the territorial integrity of Ukraine, and we call for the, uh, you know, for Russia to pull those to the, those convoys back. Oko for 15. What's the status of the fiscal 16 budget, where you had the specter of the sequestration returning? It'll be false crisis after these other crises ebb. So uh, wh what's the uh, well, we're hoping it's not a. We're hoping it doesn't become a crisis, Tony. I mean, we want Congress to do the right thing, which is to was to repeal sequestration and get it off the books. The work on the 16 budget continues. The comptroller has given the services guidance to deal with a range of options. I won't speculate any further than that. Well, you were here two years ago when the Pentagon was getting criticized for not planning for sequestration. Right. Contrast that with today in terms of planning for what may likely happen. As I said, we've given the services a, a planning guidance for a range of options, a range of budgetary options. Uh, I really don't want to go into any more detail than that. Um, but, um, you saw uh, how we dealt with uh, sequestration and the, and the planning that we did for it when we submitted the 15 budget. Um, uh, so our focus right now is on um, getting that 15 budget authorized and appropriated. Uh, we, we've uh, not only had public hearings, we've had many uh, briefings up on the Hill. Um, and then secondary to that is the ongoing work of the 16 budget, and I just won't go into details on that. Can you take a shot at you one thing? Why are we only learning about this, Korea, this uh, China P8 incident four days after it happened? Why didn't you disclose it quicker? Well, there's a, uh, there's not, there wasn't some uh, Machiavellian intent here to conceal. I think we needed to process the information and kind of figure out what really happened. Um, and I also uh, so f believe, and I, and I think this was the right course too, we wanted to make sure that we um, had taken the opportunity to register our deep concern directly uh, with the PLA, which we've done. And um, it made no sense to go public with that uh, until we had had a chance to deliver that to Marsh, which we did, which we did today. I am not aware of a response. Maggie? Any indication from U.S. allies whether they'd be willing to participate in airstrikes in northern Iraq? I mean, many of them have agreed to deliver weapons. Mm -hmm. um, have they talked about possible airstrikes? And if not, I'd, I'd like to know why, why, why they'd express hesitancy and why we're the only ones out there. Your question yeah. presumes hesitancy. I, I won't. I, I'm absolutely not going to speak for other countries up here. I. Um, it's hard enough for me just to speak for, you know, what I have to speak for here. I'm not. I'm. Uh, I speak for the United States military. That's my job. I'm not going to talk about what other countries uh, are willing to do and, and on what timeline. Yes. But, uh, I, I, I don't know. I pointed at her. I'll get to you after that. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, the chairman said that the Joint Operations Center in Erbil and Baghdad are evolving. I was wondering if you could describe how they've changed since they were first set up and if the U.S. is looking at beefing up the one in Erbil. Um, the Joint Operations Centers are both, uh, they continue to be operational, one in Baghdad and one in Erbil. Um, uh, the personnel have, uh, in each one, have stayed fairly static. I mean, there's some fluctuations. I think I can give you an update. Uh, in Baghdad, there's uh, 93 people in that Joint Operations Center. In Erbil, it's 68, and that's stayed pretty steady. Hasn't changed much. I'm not aware of any plans to beef them up. I think they're they're right about where they need to be for what we're doing. When you said evolving. Does it mean the things that they're doing versus the number of people that are there? Are they uh, just that now that now that they're up and running and now we are conducting kinetic airstrikes uh, inside Iraq? Uh, uh, they um, they are working um, more and more closely every day with Iraqi and Kurdish forces on. Um, on assistance and providing some advice from the joint operations centers, but I I wouldn't read more into it than than that. It's just it's a like any military operation. It, it uh, you know you, every day you advance uh, and you deepen the dialogue, you deepen the cooperation, that kind of thing. Yes. Now now it's your turn. To the question regarding the allies and partners in the region. Yeah. At least, can you give us a few details? At what level the U.S. military is cooperating with partner and allies in the region conducting these operations in northern Iraq? And the sec secondly, uh, can I get your assessment about the situation in Syria in terms of the ISIL and the moderate opposition clashes? How this airstrike 
uh, operations will affect the situation in Syria while the ISIL seems free to go back to Syria with the heavy weaponry they got from the Iraqi army? Well, the answer to your second question is that we haven't made any decisions uh, uh, with, uh, with regard to uh, Syria. I don't have anything to – I'm not going to speak about um, operations that we're, uh, we're not conducting, so I, I, I couldn't possibly begin to answer that question. On your, on your first question, um, uh, the international partners that we're dealing with most every day in Iraq – uh, the Iraqis, and um, we've made it clear that uh, a big part of our job there is to help assist them in combating this threat, and we're doing that every day. Um, the the there have been some international partners who have come forward uh, and made it public that they would um, assist in the humanitarian side of that mission, the uh, UK and Australia, um, the French, uh, and others, Italy, um, and I'll let them speak to what they're doing and, and how they're doing it and, and decisions they're making. But uh, with regard to day-to-day, -to -day, and particularly with respect to the airstrikes that we're conducting, it's being conducted with the, uh, our partners in Iraq, the, our Iraqi partners. Yep. I got budget, time for just a couple more. On the budget, are we likely to see an additional OSA <coughs> request before Congress takes up its spending measures sometime in September? For the Iraq uh, I'm not aware of any, and I wouldn't get ahead of uh, of that, I think the secretary said it pretty well yesterday that uh, we think we're going to be okay for fiscal year 14. Uh, but he wouldn't. Uh, he opened the door for the possibility that in fifth, for 15 we might, you know, we might need to look at um, uh, some additional uh, funding sources. But we're not there yet. We just we just don't know. Do you have any sense of a timeline of when that decision? I do not. Made? No. You had your hand up for like ever. He got. Oh, she said that was easy. All right, last one. <clears throat> Sorry, so I want to go back to the China uh, fighter. Excuse if I'm excuse me if I'm naive about this, but you said they intercepted the P-8, and I was wondering if there was any message from the Chinese pilot about why they were intercepting it, and uh, if if uh, there are any standard um, procedures that go with an interception, um, if they had. Noted if well, you're not supposed to do a barrel roll over the aircraft. Um, look, I, I, uh, I'm not aware of any radio communications. Uh, I, I'd point you to Pacific Command for details like that. Um, I think the message that they were apparently trying to send was, you know, they uh, uh, resisting the the flight of this this uh, patrol aircraft, which I remind you, as I said at the outset, was in international airspace. And the message we're sending back to China is that's unacceptable and, and unhelpful to the military relationship that we would like to have with them. Um, listen, before I go, I, I, I tried to make a quip, and I don't think I, it came off the way. When I said I have a hard enough time doing this, I meant my own eloquence. I didn't mean that I don't like the job and what I'm doing. And I very much do uh, enjoy the privilege of being up here, but I was just talking about my own poor performance on most days. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. What is the possibility you, would, you could release photos or video of the We'll PA take a look at it. I don't, I don't want to give you a It would be great if you could do that today, quite frankly. No, really.